It's good to see you all this morning. Hope you're all keeping well. And it's certainly good to see Alan back with us today. We're so thankful for what God has done um, for Christian and, and how things have been working. It's a real answer to prayer, and we're really grateful for that. So can we just gather here and pray a wee second and give thanks? Because obviously it's not a nice situation to find yourself in. And just how God has worked with that is, is truly wonderful. So I want to give thanks to God and pray for a few people here that may need a wee help from the Lord uh, in the fellowship. Father, we want to thank you that you're the good shepherd to your flock and you care and you look out for your flock that are in different stages of their lives and different needs and different problems. And yet you're the good shepherd that comes along with compassion and tenderness and you're able, Father, to meet those needs so fully. We just thank you for what you've been doing with We Christian over these past number of weeks, Lord. And we know this past month has been especially difficult, but we thank you for your faithfulness and your mercy and how you've just been working, Lord. And we pray that you'll continue to heal him. We pray that you'd continue to minister to him today. And Lord, we ask you to give him health and strength. And Lord, also for Alan and Jacqueline and Zeke and Catherine and the family, we pray that you'd just continue to give them the peace that they need. We pray that you would hold their hand in these seasons of time when, Lord, there could be questions and, and Father, thoughts that fly through their minds. We pray that you'd just be their peace and comfort and their stay. And we just thank you for how you've been so faithful to answer prayer for these things. And for Sharon as well, we ask you to minister healing into her body. Uh, Lord, as she's still in hospital, and pray that you'd touch her and help her, Lord, and cause her, Father, to regain strength and health. And for others here in the fellowship and their different needs and different Father, experiences and different demands that are laid on their lives. We pray that you'd minister and help them and that you would be all in all to them. So we pray now as we open your word that the Holy Spirit would come and open up these things to our understanding. God, shed light onto our path, shed light onto our minds today. Lord, just enter the corridors of our thoughts and shed light into those areas. We come before you now and we open our eyes and open our ears and uh, precious Father, we pray now that you'll speak loud and clearly to us all. I pray you'll fill us afresh and give us the grace that we need even now. And we bind everything contrary to the Holy Ghost and bring everything under the power of the cross of Jesus and everything under his resurrection. And pray now that you'd speak loud and clear and bless our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm just double checking that's not going to go dish on me again, is it? Because this sounds like a comedy routine or something. Uh, but just in case. No, we'll go to Psalm 26 here this morning. Psalm 26. I was reading this wee passage this week, and I'm just going to share it with us to, this morning. It may not be a passage that we're very familiar with, um, but it, it's a very precious passage, and it's something where, where David is praying. So we're going to read this together. And we might stop now and again and make a mention or two of a wee thing. So here is uh, Psalm 26, and it's a, it's a psalm or a prayer of David. And this is where he begins. He, he prays, Vindicate me, O Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord. Now, we often say to vindicate someone is to prove that they're innocent. But typically it can also mean, God, would you examine my life? Will you open my life up? And may you look at me. And if there's things that are right, will you confirm that they're right? But if there are things which are wrong, will you correct those things? That's what David's praying when he asks the Lord to vindicate him. He says, for I have walked in my integrity. He says, to the best of my knowledge, I'm walking with an upright life. To the best of my knowledge, my, my life is clean because I've trusted in the Lord. So it's interesting, the Bible says that righteousness and godly living is never by works. It's by faith. It's by depending on the promises that God makes that he says, I give you the grace to live a godly life. I give you the grace to do this. So he says, I've trusted in the Lord. And he says, I shall not slip. Or another way to put it is, I shall not backslide. It's interesting, backsliding is rarely if ever caused because somebody else tempts you. Backsliding is always due to unbelief of some description, where we have failed to trust God in a specific way. And because our faith in God has collapsed on a certain area or a certain uh, scenario of life, we slip back into our old habits. But the, that's what David says. He says, I've trusted in the Lord and I shall not slip. I shall not slip. 
So verse 2 continues in the same idea. He says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me, or test me, he means. Like the idea of, a, of gold being tested by fire. And you find what's the fool's gold, and you find what's the real gold. He says, I want the real McCoy and the real gold in my life. He said, try my mind and my heart, my thoughts even, my emotions. He says in verse 3, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. By the way, verse 4 and 5, it's not that David is talking about seating arrangements. Don't think that, you know, if, he, if David got on the bus today, and there happened to be an idolater and a hypocrite and an evildoer or a wicked person, he wasn't going to sit beside them on the bus. The idea of sitting in the, in the Bible, it means to be in fellowship means to be in agreement. It means to be consenting with what they believe in, to follow what they're wanting to do. He says, I have not made those agreements. I have not entered into a fellowship with those things. But he says in contrast, verse 6, I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim of the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hand is a sinister scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. It's very interesting whenever the Bible mentions bribery or the whole area of bribes, it's normally a morality for sale. That's the idea of it, that you could be basically bought off at the highest price and you'll just do what people want you to do. So that's why he says, I'm not, I'm not like those people that are you know, in and out, they're, they're, they're relative to where the money is. But verse 11 ends it all off. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity, redeem me, and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place in the congregations. I will bless the Lord. Very interesting, by the way, when you look at verse 1, he says, I've trusted in the Lord and I shall not slip. And then at the end of verse 12, he says, uh, my foot stands in an even place in the congregations. I will bless the Lord. So he's talking about not slipping in that way. But this Psalm 26, you might read it, and there's not really anything there that might stand out to you. And you might wonder what the big message is of this one psalm. But I think you can really encapsulate the one psalm in one word. And the one word is reality. Reality. It's David desiring the real thing in his life. He's desiring the real thing. And I could just highlight a couple of wee things there to you. He says in verse uh, 3, I have walked in your truth. I've been real. That's what he's talking about. Verses 4 and 5, he says, I will not sit with hypocrites, those who are fake or those who are false. He talks about there uh, at the end of it in verse 11, I walk in my integrity. And he says, my feet stand in an even place in the congregations I will bless the Lord. David is looking for the real thing. He's looking for the real thing. And also he's tired of phoniness and he's tired of fakeness. That's what he's really, really thinking about here. I want you to realize just the imagery that's coming out here in chapter 26, because you mightn't pick it up immediately, but it is interesting. David is wanting to go, it says there in verses 6 and 7, he says, I want to go into the house of the Lord. I want to go into the place where God's presence is manifested and where God's presence is showing up in what we call the glory. And we'll talk about that in a wee minute. But he says, I want to go into this place, right, where God is. But he says, outside of the house of the Lord, outside of the tabernacle where God is meeting men, there's all these guys who are congregating around God's house. And he describes them there, verses 4 and 5. They're idolaters, hypocrites, evildoers, and wicked. It says there in 9 and 10, they're, they're known as sinners, bloodthirsty men, sinister schemers, men who are bribing. Could you imagine that this is a place where, where David is saying, the house of God, where God is showing up in such an unusual way, you've got all these different types of people that want to associate themselves with the house of the Lord. And he says, between the reality of God and the fakery of men is but a door. Between the reality of God who dwells there in his glory 
and a God who shows up in all of his power, and outside that same door, there's all these other guys who are up to no good. And that's what often you find in religious worlds and religious people. They, they talk about God, and they talk about the presence of God, and they talk about who God is, and they sing and, and do all the things that they do. But they're oftentimes guilty of these very things. It's fascinating whenever you think of it. It's such a perceptive image that David is giving us here. But he's looking for the real thing. That's what he's looking for. He wants to know God, but he doesn't want anything of the religious charade. He's not looking for anything phony or fake, which oftentimes can happen. I don't know about you, but I get incredibly tired when anybody is fake with me. I really have a low pain threshold when it comes to the area of fakery or insincerity. I really don't like it. And earlier this week, my mum and I happened to go out. I took my mum out for a shopping trip. And we went into the supermarket and we had the unfortunate experience of meeting those dear people who probably have the worst job, I think, in the whole world. And it's talking to the general public and approaching strangers to talk about their company. It's probably the worst job that you can imagine. So we were walking into the supermarket and I could see this well-dressed wee girl in her late teens probably, and this other fella, and he was well-dressed in the same age. And I saw they looked at us, and I thought, oh boy, we're caught now. We are, we are, it's like when you watch David Attenborough and the lion's about to get the zebra. I thought, we're in for it now. We're, we're going to get a claw that they're going to get us. And I started to talk to mum about, oh, well, isn't it nice weather or something, you know, and try to do anything to deflect and to say, look, we're busy in conversation. And then what happened was this big Colgate smile came up my nose. And she says, are you busy to death? Said, yes, we are, in fact. But why, this is why I'm here. And she went into this spiel of, you know, it's nice to see, isn't it a lovely day? And I just thought, this is not what you're wanting to talk to me about. You do not want to talk to me about the weather. You do not want to talk to me about how nice the world is. What you want is my money. So what are you wanting, right? But she kept going and she said to my mom, you look so well and you're looking dressed well today. And then she turned to me and she said, you know, what age are you? And I says, I'm 30. And she says, gosh, you look so young. And I, I, just, I just stood there and I said, did I take that as a compliment or is this fake? And then thinking, no, she's thinking I'm like Jurassic Park or something. And I just went, oh. And then my mom just, she had the saving grace. She turned around to the girl as only she could do. And she says, I don't want to waste your time today, which is a kind way of saying, would you stop wasting mine? And she turned to the girl and said, what is it? And she says, I want you to sign up for this thing and you're going to donate money. And he said, no, we can't. We're not today. But whenever somebody's not being real with us, when anybody's not being genuine with us, it's tiring. And you oftentimes, I've been thinking of it even this week, how often do we actually come to God and we're giving them this patter of saying, you're great and you're lovely, and you're marvelous, and you're all the rest. But really what we're there for is to get our money's worth. Really what we're there for is to get our pound of flesh. And you must sometimes imagine the Lord gets somewhat tired of church gatherings. Because he read of it in the Old Testament. He says, I get tired of your feasts. I get tired of your ritual. I get tired of, of, of how that you sing to me with all your voice, and you tell me that you love me, but your heart is removed from me, and you tell that you love me in the, in the gathering of the church, but the way that you're living outside of the church is not pleasing to me. And the Lord says, I get tired of it. It's phony. It's fake. And that's what David's talking about here in Psalm 26. He's looking for the real thing. The real thing. That's what he's talking about. And I don't know about you, but maybe you get tired of it as well. I certainly do. And I get tired of the hamster wheel of religious life. I want to know God. And I want God to show up in unusual ways. That's what my heart is very much. I want to look at a number of wee things here. Let's look at this desire that David has, because this is the desire all of us should have here this morning. And it's found there in verse, um, verse 8. Look at that verse, if you may. David is really opening his heart. He's opening his heart right the way up, right? And it's really interesting if you open up somebody's heart and you find out what really gets them ticking, that's the real person. When you hear about what they love, what gets them excited, what gets them thrilled, that's the real person. And here's David 
opening up his heart. And he's being so honest and he's being so genuine and he's being so transparent. He says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. David's not fake here. He's not singing to the choir. He's not giving God what he thinks God wants to hear. He's actually telling God what he really feels. He's saying to the Lord, I love your presence. I love the times when I've gone into your house and I've sensed your presence there. I've known that you are here. I've known that you're right beside me. I've felt that. I've known that. And he says, I love when your glory comes. I love that. And that is the only difference, friends, between religious hypocrisy and the real thing. The religious hypocrite doesn't really love the presence of God. They love the recognition that they get in the house of God. They love the sense of somewhere to go to. They love the sense of structure or organization. And they love other things, but they don't love what David loves. And that's what often is the marker in many congregations. In many congregations, it doesn't matter where the church is, you could literally put a line down the congregation and you could say there are those who love to go to church and there's those who love the presence of God. There's a key difference. There's people who love to go to church because, as I say, for those reasons. But then there's those who said, we've met God. We've experienced the Lord in our own lives and we love that. I remember speaking to a minister up in the Isle of Hebrides in Lewis. And he talked about how he, his congregation in Barvis was the congregation that saw the revival in Lewis. And he, we had the opportunity of meeting some of the converts who were saved in that revival in 1949. And they're well in their 80s now. I don't know how many of them are even alive when I met them maybe four years ago. But this is what he said. He says there's something different about them that have experienced the presence of God and those who went to church all their lives. Even though both of them are saved, even though both of them are born again, he said, those who had intense experiences of God, it's as if they're marked. They love the presence of the Lord. But he says, those who've just gone to church all their life, they're nice people, they're good people. But he says, there's a difference. And there is a difference. There's a key difference between those who've experienced the Lord and carry that presence and those who just maybe go through the motions in a church service. I want you to look at this wee idea where David says in verse 8, he says, I love the place where your glory dwells. It literally means the tabernacle of your glory. It's very interesting. Whenever you read through the Psalms, David on seven occasions talks about experiences that he's had with what he calls the glory of the Lord. In Hebrew, it is the kabod. It means the heaviness. It means the weight of God's presence. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you felt God's presence, not just in a gentle, peaceful way, but you felt the weight of of his presence resting upon you. Maybe that's foreign language, but maybe you have. I can remember one time especially where that has happened. Uh, I remember going with Hazel and a, another friend of ours to a place in South Wales called Val de Brennan. It's known as the Hill of the Angels, and it's a, it's a prayer retreat. And there's a book written about it called The Grace Awakening, and it's, it's, it's an amazing wee place to visit. But I remember going to that place, and I could remember going to have a wee, the wee prayer room and I remember going into that place, and all I can say, as soon as I walked through the door, there was this heavy presence. There was this heavy atmosphere. And there's just these wee cushions on the floor, and you would have sat down, and you just sat there for 45 minutes, and nobody said anything. The opposite side of the room, there were these students from Singapore. We never spoke, you know, we were in the same room for 45 minutes and never spoke to one another. None of us prayed. None of us sang. None of us did anything. We just sat there in the room for 45 minutes. They cried. They cried, they just, they were weeping because God was there in his heavy glory. A way of thinking about the glory of God is when you leave an experience and God has impacted you. God has impacted you because the word kabod, as I said, is a heaviness. It means the footprint. So if I was to walk through a muddy field and my size tens were to land into the ground, I have left my glory on the ground or I have left an impression or an impact on the ground. Maybe you've had experiences with the Lord where there was this deep impact left on your soul and you still have God's footprint or maybe more gently, God's fingerprints are still upon your life. That's what the glory of God really refers to. But let's look at these seven examples. They are really wonderful. Some of them maybe you can relate to. Some of them are something we want to desire more of. 
But let's look at these seven wee examples. We'll fly through them very quickly here. Psalm 19 and 1. David writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Have you ever had that experience, maybe, where you've been walking through the night sky and you see the stars and all the rest, and what do you realize is that there is a creator? It really hits you. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but you've ever seen and you've just looked at the whole big serrat of creation and you just say, he made that. He made that. How awesome and how wonderful this God must be if indeed, look at all this, what we see around us. I have a friend years back, and we used to laugh, we used to keep him going. He really was in, in love with the Lord and he was really going deeper into the Lord. He's only newly saved. But what he used to do was he used to take a deck chair out in the middle of the night with a high-vis jacket on and he would just go stargazing. And he would just worship the Lord in the middle of the field. And we used to keep him going. He says, you're out stargazing tonight. And he says, it was a good in the other night. <laughs> All the rest. But it's, it's, a, it's the glory of God. When you see the vastness of creation and you see the vastness of the cosmos and all these things, you just are led into an experience of wonder. Have you ever had an experience of wonder where you're really impacted by the wonder, how wonderful the Lord truly is? That's something of the glory. Psalm 24 and verse 7, a very familiar wee verse. It says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. David was talking there about an experience where he says, when we were in this tabernacle, we felt that the majesty of God, he came as a king into our midst. We knew that he had authority. We knew he had power. We knew that he was the boss. And we just felt we needed to surrender before him. We were so conscious of him as the king of glory. That's majesty. So you had wonder and you have majesty. We'll look here at Psalm 29 and verse 3 where it says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. In other words, David says when God speaks, it's so loud and it's so noticeable, it's like a thunderstorm. He says it, it, it just disrupts your life. It just completely breaks into what happened in your life. And maybe there's been times where you were in a situation where God spoke to you so clearly, unmistakably, that it, it almost took you a couple of days to process what happened to you. I can think of wee occasions where Hazel and myself, I think last year, um, we were at a wedding and there was a couple, really godly people, and they said to us, oh, are you leaving soon? We met them at the breakfast and said, are you leaving soon? I said, yes, we're leaving. We'd love to meet you at the foyer at half 10. And Hazel, and I says to Hazel, you go for a walk there. I'm going to go to the room and clear up and we'll meet these people at half 10. I says, well, then we'll get up wherever we're going to go next. And we sat down in that foyer and this woman and, and her husband began to prophesy over our lives and began to say things about us that only Hazel and myself knew about. Things that God was saying to us that we were, we were leaving flabber and we were literally taking notes, just notes upon notes because God had our number. God knew everything about us. This couple knew nothing about us because we had to explain to them afterwards, you not going to realize what you were saying. He says, no, we just, this is the Lord was telling us to say to you. And it's the voice of the Lord. It's the voice of the Lord that is so powerful. It's so full of majesty. That's something of his glory. Look at Psalm 63 and verse 2. This is what David talks then about this other experience he had. Psalm 63 and verse 2. He says, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary. He says, I'm looking for God. I want God to show up. Tell me this. What are you looking for? What, what would you like to see happen this week? You know, that's what David says, I'm looking for something. What are you looking for? Peace of mind? You know, nobody to annoy you today. You get your Sunday afternoon nap, you get a good bit of beef into you. I mean, what are you looking for? David says, I'm looking for you in the sanctuary. He says this, to see your power and your glory. You ever been in an atmosphere where God's power is? Where you feel that God can do anything in a moment? Oftentimes when you go to an awful lot of churches, people don't believe God can do anything. People just believe that God just sort of saves you and that's all he does. Well, here's a God who's able to do anything. And David felt that. He said, we're in an atmosphere where I just believe God could do anything. It's going to be so exciting. I long for those days. I long for the days where the most exciting place to be is in a prayer meeting because God could do it. I, I love the story they used to say about the Hebrides. Whenever the revival broke out there, they used to have prayer meetings, right? And in the middle of this wee parochial prayer meeting, God would lay on their hearts and say, start praying for somewhere in South Africa. 
And these are people that have never left the island in their lives and they didn't know where anything is. But God would lay that on their hearts to pray for. And what would happen is God would break out in revival and then they would hear the news coming back to them. God answered prayer in that way because God's Spirit led them to do it. God can do anything. I mean, he can do anything at all. I always laugh at the story. I don't laugh at it in a derisory way, but I laugh because I think it's really wonderful. When Smith Wigglesworth, there was a man came to him one day and uh, the man was a double amputee. He had no feet. And uh, the man came forward, you know, in his wheelchair and he says, Mr. Wigglesworth, I believe you're a man of faith and a man who prays for the sick and you've seen God move. And Smith Wigglesworth stopped him and then says, I'm not praying for you, go and buy shoes. So he stopped him and said, you know, you're supposed to pray for me. You're supposed to go through the religious ritual. You're supposed to pray and make me feel good about myself. And then I go home and nothing happens. That's what most people view healing for prayer, healing prayer like. You know, just tell me, you know, you're all right there and you go home and you're still sick. Wigglesworth says, go you to the cobblers and ask for a pair of shoes. So here this man, a double amputee, comes in with a wheelchair, <laughs> being brought into the cobblers, and he says to the cobblers, could you get me two pairs of shoes? And the boy says, you having a laugh. Are you actually having a laugh? Are you caught me? He says, no, I feel God has told me to do this for this man of God. I'm going to do it. And no word of a lie. He got his pair of shoes, and as soon as the shoes were put near his amputated stumps, the feet began to grow <laughs> into the shoes. Some people say, I don't believe that happened. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> God does it. God's the one who's able to do that sort of stuff. You read history. Break out of your theological bubbles. Break out of your own wee traditions. Read, explore, find out what God's able to do. In fact, I mean, if you read the Bible, for goodness sake, he's able to do quite a lot of stuff. So it's about time we start to believe who he is instead of trying to bring him down to our level. So that's, you could say, wonder, majesty, his voice. You could talk about power. Look at Psalm 85. Now, this is something that, I mean, we've all experienced, God willing. Uh, Psalm 85 and verse 9. This is another glory experience David had. He says in Psalm 85 and verse 9, he says, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Salvation, David says, is a sign of the glory of God. Whenever God's glory shows up, people start getting saved in considerable numbers. It's a normal thing to happen. I'm looking forward to the days, I don't know about you, where people are getting saved every day, as it says in the book of Acts, men were being added to the church daily, such as need to be saved. Would you like to see that? Well, that's nice to know. You're <laughs> resounding enthusiasm. God wants to do that. He says, whenever salvation happens, the glory of the Lord dwells on the land. Dwells on the land. It's an interesting thing, actually, throughout history. Whenever God moves in communities, they often talk about people will start to see a boat resting over the land. This, this happened in Lewis. I'm, I'm maybe quoting Lewis an awful lot. But the, the people of Lewis would often say they saw a glory boat that would rest over the bog land. They talked about this. They would say this happened. They said there was this apparition that would appear over the bogs. And they would say it was a boat. You can disagree if you want to, but that's what they said happened. But as soon as that happened, People were getting saved in huge numbers in their scores and they weren't getting saved and then backsliding the next week. They were really saved and no backsliding. That's what it's been referred to there. It says, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in, in your land. Let's skip on here. Psalm 145. <clears throat> Psalm 145 and verses 11 and 12. It says this, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and his glorious majesty of his kingdom. All that kingdom talk is very much the language of spiritual warfare. It's the language of breakthrough. It's the language of deliverance. Whenever God's kingdom comes against the kingdom of darkness and God's kingdom overcomes the kingdom of darkness. David says whenever the glory of God shows up, that's when demon power gets chased out of the scene. He says, our enemies are defeated before us. God's power is manifested and we see our enemies driven out of the situation. Many Christians have not seen the area of deliverance. They've never seen firsthand what God does in deliverance. But whenever somebody has an evil spirit and the presence of God comes, the demonic has to go. And it's very vivid and it's very violent sometimes when it happens. 
God's power shows up and his glory shows up and demonic stuff has to go. It goes in very, very quick fashion. It's an amazing thing to witness. But there you see the fault line between two kingdoms. You see the kingdom of God and you see the kingdom of darkness. And you're so thankful that you're part of God's kingdom. You're so thankful when you see that happen. I'm so thankful he took me out of that bad kingdom and brought me into the good kingdom. Let's look at this last we want. Psalm 149, Psalm 149 and verse 5. David writes, he says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. <clears throat> Always makes me smile. Christians are often on their beds. They're sleeping most of the time. But it says they sing aloud on their beds because of glory, joy. Real joy, not just muted joy, not just quiet enthusiasm, but all out there, all passionate singing unto the Lord. So you take those seven experiences that David talks about when he ever, he says, I've experienced the glory of God. He says, there were times where I had his wonder. I was so overwhelmed by the wonder of the Lord. He said, there were times where his majesty would have hit my heart, where I knew he was the king. He said, there were times where he spoke to me and I knew he was speaking really loud and clear into my life. He said, of times where I knew his power was there and God could do anything. Times of salvation where I saw him breaking into situations and saving and delivering people. And then he says about obviously victory and how there was the overcoming of enemies. And then finally, that whole aspect of joy. So when you go back to Psalm 26 and David says, I long to be in the place where your glory dwells. He's not just talking silly talk. He's not just giving rhetoric. He's not just spooling off nonsense. He really knows what he's talking about. The man knows his onions, as we talk about. The man knows what he's talking about. He says, I have been in the place where the glory of God shows up. And he says, I want that. I want that with all of my heart. I want that with everything I've got. Another wee thing about his reality. You see that in verse, end of verse 6. Second part of it. He said, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. What was David talking about wanting to go around an altar for? What was he talking about that for? In the Old Testament, you would often take the sacrifice for your sin. You bring it to the altar. You lay the, the priest lays his hands on the animal and the sin is transferred onto the animal and the blood is shed and the animal is killed upon the altar. You might notice in this church today, there is no altar. There is no altar required because Jesus went to the altar. He went to Calvary. He went to the place where God made a sacrifice for sin forever. And at the cross, Jesus paid for our sins once and for all. So to take this into a New Testament language, what, Paul, what uh, David is saying here, he says, I want to go to Calvary all over again. I want to walk around Calvary, and as he says there in verse 7, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. I just want to ask you that question this morning. It's a worthwhile one to ask you. When was the last time the cross became real to you? When was the last time you thought of the cross of what Jesus did for you there? And I mean, it completely and utterly rocked your boat. It shook your world out of kilter. It just amazed you when you thought of just... He actually did that for me. And, and, he, and he did that. And, he, and, and I have this now because of what he did for me. Has that ever hit you? Because I find an awful lot of Christians, they've lost the wonder of the cross. They, they've lost the wonder of God's glory. They've lost the wonder of his presence. They've lost the wonder of the cross. And do you know what we've settled for? We've settled with the company of the people outside the tabernacle that David talks about there in verses 4 and 5. And all those guys, they're hypocrites. They're playing a game. They, they call about God and talk about God and Bibles and books and outreaches and everything else. But the reality of God says, I want to know the Lord and I want to thank him for what he's done for my life. That sincerity sometimes is lacking. And I would want us to say this, to, I want to say this to us this morning. I don't want us to be a people that are insincere. I don't want us to be inauthentic. Do you want to be real? The answer course is yes you really do this is what David says this is the second thing I want to say to you if you want to be real with God and have what David's talking about here the key is verse 6 the first part he says I will wash my hands in innocence I will wash my hands in innocence 
What presumably happened, according to this psalm, is before a worshiper would go into the house of the Lord or go into the tabernacle, where God's presence and glory and the altar was there, what he would do was he would stand there and he would wash his hands. And it wasn't because he was going to go in and maybe have a meal or he was going to, you know, do something like that there. But by washing his hands, what he was declaring was, my life is clean. My life, to the best of my knowledge, is clean. That, you know, think of it like this. <clears throat> when a surgeon, maybe you've seen uh, dramas or you've seen real life stuff, surgeons will wash right the way, not just their fingertips, they wash right the way to their elbows. And they all do that funny thing when they have, you know, put their gloves on and they, they walk like this and have to beat through doors and all the rest. And really what they're saying is, look, we are sterile. There is no threat of infection. There's no danger of bringing contamination to the holy ground in, in this context. God is saying, if you want to be serious with me, you need to have a clean life. You need to have a clean life. And may I remind you, and this is simple, there are two types of dirty hands. If any one of us here was to go to the farmyard, and there's plenty of them in this vicinity, and you were asked to muck in, and, uh, you know, it's, it's what it says it is. There's muck involved. What way would your wee hands be? If your wee hands would be as brown as your boot, and if you stuck out a wee paw there and says, can I shake your hand? The person said, no, thank you. <laughs> would you mind just, you know, doing some of them? There's overtly dirty hands. There's people who are claiming to be God's people. And they're involved in scandalous things that the whole community, even the lost, look at and say, you are not living right before God. Don't talk to us about God. Go pay your bills. Don't talk to us about God. Go and sort out your family. Don't talk to us about God. Would you mind your language and would you start to live right? There's Christians and they really need to be told that. Your hands are not clean. Your hands are in the pig muck. Your hands are in the pig muck and you have a bad name. Go and clean your hands. But then there's a second type of hands. And if let's say, God forbid, there was a big minger here this morning who happened to use the, use the facilities. I always laugh, the, the, the Victorians used to call it room 100 and we now call it the loo. Um, but if you went to the loo and you happened to use the facilities but you never washed your hands and you left the facilities there and your hands, you know, there'd be nothing there to the visible eye to say there was something wrong but your hands are dirty. And if you were to prepare food or you were to shake someone's hand, there's a real danger of infection. And there's Christians and their lives and their sins are largely invisible. Their sin is not scandalous. Their sin is well managed. Their sin is well, you know, respectable in some way. It could be pride, could be jealousy, could be unforgiveness and unbelief. It could be a variety of hidden things, invisible things. But David says, I want my hands clean. If I want to know the glory and the presence and the altar of the Lord, I want my hands to be clean. I don't want any, any, any speck of dirt, visible or invisible, on my hands. I want my life to be clean. You take that as contrast, you know, verses 4 and 5 and then also 9 and 10. He says, I don't want any idolatry in my life. I don't want any other idols in my life at all. He says, I don't want any hypocrisy. I don't want any form of falseness in my life. He says, I don't want any evil doing or any wickedness. Verses 9 and 10. He says, I don't want any sin or bloodthirstiness or sinister underhand ideas or bribery. He says, I want my life to be as straight as a die. I want my life to be as straight as a die. And so if I was to ask, you know, today, I think about it sometimes, you know, you go to wee shops and things and, and you have a tab. Yeah, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we, we have a few tabs and you, you go down to the man and says, what, what's, on, what's on the tab? What do I have to pay off you? And you clear it off and, and, and it's, a, it's, a blank, it's a blank sheet. Every one of us this morning, and I'm not saying this in a judgmental or legalistic way, but every one of us has a tab and there's stuff that's on the tab that needs to be cleaned up. There may be things in your life today and they may be huge, huge costs, big, big whoppers, let's say. You need to go and clear that up.
But if it's only tuppence or a small amount, you still need to clear it off. We need to have clean record books. The old Christian used to say, keep small accounts with God. How's your accounts this morning? How's the accounts? Because if we don't deal with our issues, our issues will soon deal with us. I feel to read this passage right now. It's Psalm 19. This is a serious word of warning that David gives us. Psalm 19, read this for yourself. Be serious with, be serious with God. That's what I'm telling you. Psalm 19, and it says, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Who can understand why he does the strange things he does? David prays this. Cleanse me from, what does it say in your Bible? Secret faults. Secret faults. Tell me, who knows the secret faults? Who humanly would know the secret faults? Just you. You're the only one who would know it. There's nobody looking over your shoulder says, I know what you've done. <laughs> there are secret faults. But David says, cleanse me from the secret thoughts. He says in verse 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Sins that I think I can get away with. Right? Let them not have dominion over me. The secret stuff that we tolerate will dominate us if we're not dealing with it. You need to deal with that. But go on, look what David says. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. Most Christians are running away from the great transgression because they don't want people talking about them. But David says, I deal with the secret transgression. Because you know what? The great transgression may be in the eyes of men, but the secret transgression is in the eyes of God. Which is worse? You would say it's always all sin is in front of God's eyes. But if we honestly think that we're cleverer than God, we're pretty thick. This week, if I was to tell you of all the sins I've had to repent of, thankfully not <laughs> great transgressions. Thanks be to God for that. But there's things that God deals with me on and I can't get away with them. I can't get away with them. He doesn't allow me away with them. He has to get me on my knees and I says, I'm sorry. I got it wrong. I really did it wrong. And none of you would know about it. And it'll not be the front page of tomorrow. So don't worry, don't think I'm up to no good or something. But God doesn't allow you because you want to be real with him. You really want him to be real. I want to end this off. Go to Psalm 26. I could be speaking to you this morning and you're in agreement with me and you're saying, look, God is real. I know that's true. And I do want to know more of his presence. I do want to know more of his glory. I do want a fresh walk with the Lord. And yeah, you're probably right. I do need to wash my hands. But I don't really feel up to it. I don't really feel, you know, capable, quite honestly. Verse 3 has blessed me this week, and I want to read it to you. Psalm 26 and verse 3. David says, Your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. What's the secret to reality in the Christian life? What's the secret to the real thing? What's the secret to stopping you from being a hypocrite and a religious performer? What, what is the secret? He says in verse 3, he says, I see that you love me. That's what it literally means. I see that you love me. All the translation says, I am mindful that you love me. I'm mindful. I realize that you really love me. I'd say this this morning to you. I think there's an awful lot of Christians don't seek God with all of their heart because they just picture God like their grumpy dad or their critical mother. They think that God is like mummy or daddy that was distant and was harsh and was critical and oftentimes would have treated them unfairly. And they just say, what's the point of seeking God? I'm just going to get the same outcome as I got from mum and dad. May I tell you something revolutionary this morning? God is not your mum and dad. He's God. And he loves you in a way that no other human being has ever loved you. He loves you perfectly and he loves you personally and he loves you unmistakably. You could be here today and you say, look, I've had so much rejection 
in my life. I have had so much failure in my life. I just said to myself, what's the point of seeking God? Because you know what? I'm just going to get rejected all over again. And God's going to label me as a failure. And there's no point, And I can't do it. But you know what I can do? I can work on the farm or I can work in joinery or I can work, you know, in business and banking and I can work and raise my kids. Those things I can do, but the seeking of God stuff, I'm liable to fail there. So I'm going to avoid the failure. Friends, he loves you. He loves you. And if you realize that he loves you, you can make any step towards him. It doesn't matter who has been the authority figure in your life. It doesn't matter how you've made mistakes. If you're mindful of his love, his love will inspire you to seek him. Tell me this. Have you ever been in the company of somebody that you felt you could do no wrong in? <laughs> Maybe there's a few people who said, no, this never happened to me. I've always been wrong. But you feel so comfortable in their presence that you could literally, I'm not saying blue murder, but you know, you, 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 I don't know if it was your granny or, you know, your big softy granda. I don't know. But it was somebody you could just get away with anything. And you felt so relaxed in their company. I want you to realize that God, although he's holy and although he's pure, he loves you in such a way that he can make you feel comfortable. He can make you feel safe. He can make you feel valuable. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. That whenever his love comes and fills you and I, he takes out all of the fear. He takes out all of the anxiety that you and I may have. And he removes all that sort of discouragement and that sort of feeling of, well, I can't really seek God because I'm not good enough or because somebody's going to criticize me or whatever. Whenever his love fills you and I and his love is before you, how could you not want to seek him? I mean, I was, I was talking to ones about this the other night. For those of you that are married, can you remember the first time your significant other turned around and says, I love you? Can you remember the first time that happened? Now, I'm not asking you what your romantic history is like, you know. We'll leave that to another day. But can you remember the moment where those three words, those simple three words hit you? Can you remember that? I can remember it. I can remember it big time. Changed my life. Completely changed my life. Because you know what happened? From that moment forward, I wanted to be with Hazel with all my heart. And I wanted to make any sacrifice possible to be with her. And I was willing to change my life. I was willing to do, you know what happens when you fall in love? You do stupid things. Somebody said, you know, falling in love is only cured by getting married. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, say no more. But whenever you heard those three words, I love you, from an imperfect person that you will soon find has plenty of flaws, it changed your life that you said, I want to be with them forever. I want to know their presence. I want to know everything to do about them. They have impacted my life. Now I want to give my all to them. Here's what you need to hear this morning. God Almighty, the creator of all things, turns to you and says, I love you. I love you. Even though you're a sinner, even though you're guilty, even though you're not stacking it up, I love you. How do you respond to that? Oh, well, thanks very much. I'm just going to, you know. Or does it lay claim to your life? Does it sort of say to you, wait a minute, if he says he loves me, I mean, you know, if, for instance, if, I was, if you were walking down the street and, you know, I know this isn't what happens, it shouldn't happen, but, you know, a wolf whistle or something. But let's say it was, it was nice, not, not leery in that way. But let's say somebody shouts and says, hey, I love you. Would you not just stop in your tracks? Or would you just walk on and say, maybe it's a weirdo or something, but... But you would turn around and say, who was that? Who was that? It, it would disturb your pattern of life. And yet God says he loves you. And it's not based on what you have done. It's because he says, I love you because I have chosen to put my love on you. He says, I have chosen to love. He says, it wasn't you. You didn't pull on my heartstrings. I chose to love you. I put my love on you. In Deuteronomy, he says, it. I put my love on you. So if you know a God who loves you, does that not want to make you think it's time to be real? When you heard the words, I love you, I think about it when, Hazel, when, when that happened for us. I mean, we didn't talk to one another about the weather. Because it's, it's quite cold out there today, isn't it? You know, there wasn't talk like that. It was like, well, how do we plan our future? What, what do you think about this? What, what's your opinion about it? Tell me what's your deep thoughts about this. 
I want to know you. What, what, what do you think about life? The fakery was jettisoned. And what started to happen was real life experience. Reality kicked in. Reality kicked in. This morning, friends, God wants us to be real because he wants to be real with us. He would love you to know more of his presence. He would want you to be living in a fresh place. He would like you to clean your hands, though. Much in the same way when you go to your mummy's or daddy's house and you've got big dirty boots on, they might say, would you mind taking your shoes off of the door? Or at least wipe your feet. God says the same. He says, I need you to wash your hands to come into fellowship with me. But he says, it's because I love you and I want you to be real with me. So let's just bow our heads a wee minute here. Let's just bow our heads a wee minute here. And if you're here this morning, as, as heads are bowed and as eyes are closed, if you're just saying, look, I feel to some degree I haven't been real with God. I just feel quite honestly I've not been really real with the Lord. Could you just stand to your feet and we'll pray with you. And all you're just saying is, I want to get real with God. That's all you want to say. I, I don't want to play games with the Lord any longer. I just want to be real with God. And we'll pray for you a wee minute here if that's something that you would love to do. We'll pray for you this morning. Bless you. Bless you guys. Bless you. What's so wonderful for these wee folk that have responded is that God is real with, with you. He's real with you and he, he loves you so much and he has so much that he wants you to know personally. And so, Father God, I just want to pray for those <clears throat> who have responded and even for those, Lord, who feel that, Lord, they would love to respond, but they're just struggling with things. I just want to pray, Lord, would you just come along to those people now and I pray that you'd pour in all of your love into their hearts, all of the areas that are frightened, all of the areas that are scared, all of the areas that, that just feel that people are watching them or if people are thinking of them. Would you, Lord, just pour in your love now and cast out all of the fear, all of the anxiety, all of the unworthiness that would be felt there. And I pray that you just break the lies of the enemy that have said you're not good enough and you not succeed. We pray you'll break that, Father, now in Jesus' name. And I just pray for all of us this morning that, God, that you'd take us into a new reality with yourself, that we feel the presence of God that we know the glory of God. And even as we meet this morning, Father, to take us afresh to Calvary. And Lord, just to be blessed by the thought of what Jesus has done for us. We just thank you, Jesus, that you loved us so much that you took the cross and you died for us. And Lord, you really love us and really have paid that price. And I pray now, Lord, you'll just take us into a fresh place, one and all. But we just bless those people especially. Just take a wee seat, guys, there. But Lord Jesus, just move among us as a people where we just shed off everything that's fake, everything that's not real, everything that's inauthentic and we just say, Lord, we love to be where you are. We want to stand in your courts and we want to know who you are in a deep way. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.